AWS reInvent. So first off, there were so many announcements. There's not, there's no chance uh, that we're going to be able to hit all of the core ones today. But what I thought uh, I'd like to do is really drill on, in on the EC2 announcements. And as you know, EC2 is all about compute. And uh, if nothing else, uh, what I appreciate about uh, the folks at EC2 is their ability to position. Uh, and, and as you know, my background, I, I, like Daniel and I used to have real jobs before we became analysts. Uh, and I used to run uh, product uh, strategy and, and marketing. And this is basically EC2. Uh, most largest, fastest, highest, lowest cost, best per price performance only. Uh, I like this. And that, that may sound architecture, but it clearly talks about uh, what is important to them and how they, if nothing else, uh, view them. So uh, a couple of the key announcements that I'd like to hit uh, about, about EC2 is, um, first off, um, Trainium. So Trainium is uh, AWS's homegrown machine learning and deep learning uh, training solution. Uh, right now, and as Daniel and I have talked about a ton, literally the only vendor who's been able to get traction with mach accelerated machine learning training has been uh, NVIDIA. But the promise that Trainium is making here is that uh, it will be um, the most teraflops compute power other than any other machine learning instance in the cloud. And that includes, it would have to be, uh, the NVIDIA uh, V100. I use the same Neuron SDK, uh, supports TensorFlow, MXNet, and, and PyTorch, and it will be available through SageMaker. Now, this was just an announcement and not an instance. And, and you know, there's also not as much information as you may want out there to be able to compare this to the NVIDIA uh, V100. But this isn't, I don't think this is AWS hiding anything. I, I think this is them just doing what they normally do. They announced the chip with a few broad claims, and then they announced the instance uh, with more people and uh, uh, cus beta customers uh, with, with more specs. But I think this was the biggest uh, uh, EC2 uh, announcement of the day. Yeah, that was a, that was a big one, Pat. Um, you know, of course, having had a chance to speak behind the scenes to some of the leadership on Trainium and on a, uh, AWS, you know, they also recently released uh, P4D, which was built on Ampere's uh, A100 architecture for uh, another accelerated workload. What I really got was this, Pat. If you kind of followed Andy Jass's keynote, he waved the wand of the company uh, really trying to push the envelope on training and AI workloads in the cloud, period. Now, again, up to about a year ago, if you really talked to a lot of IT leaders and even consultants and you suggested the idea of training and acceleration in the in the cloud, you'd get that, the the, the, the spinning jackpot, you know, it's too expensive. Yeah. Too much data, it's too expensive to put it there, too expensive to accelerate it. And so these companies were putting this out and on small training uh, cases, it was achievable. But what really is happening now is they're trying to democratize that. And so... AWS really has that promise. They're looking at two different um, really levers. The first is the economics, Pat. So it's the economics of um, how do we do more data uh, and train it faster is the second piece of the pie. So what I liked was Andy's approach. He, he launched Gaudi and you know uh, Habana with in, in Intel. He, he announced Trainium. They've got all the instances. You mentioned V100. You've got P4D and A100 instances. I think AWS is really trying to be, uh, and what I really got out of this is choice, not just in AI though, by the way, Pat, but just in the whole thing, whether it was their various EC2 compute instances, memory intensive, storage intensive, they're doing it with their chips, they're doing it with Intel chips, they're doing things with AMD chips. I actually really like the fact that AWS is kind of saying, look, we meet the customer where they are. Some people may look at it and say they're trying to take everybody on. I kind of look at it and they're saying, we want to give options to customers. We want the customers to be able to get the type of compute required uh, for their, their different workloads and we'll meet them where they are and we'll let them do it in the cloud. And now, by the way, Pat, they're also getting more and more focused on letting customers do it in hybrid environments and on-prem. So I thought, it was a, I thought it was a very encouraging set of announcements from Andy. Yeah, so um, 
just for those who might not be familiar with Habana out there, that was a Habana, Habana. Uh, I'm not too sure how to say that, but Habana, this was an acquisition that Intel made uh, uh, to get into the training market. Uh, the prior investment they had made, which was Nirvana, didn't work out uh, as, as they wanted. And my guess now is that Intel saw the traction that Habana, Habana was getting inside of AWS and bought the company. Uh, the big claim that they're making is that up to 40% better price performance relative to GPU-based EC2 instances. Uh, so it's not a necessarily a performance play, a performance leadership play, let's say, versus the NVIDIA V100, but more of a price performance uh, play. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Habana is that it can do inference and training, but it looks like the company is is going to stick to uh, training wor workloads first and foremost. Makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly if you have, uh, let's say, an INF1 instance uh, next to it or um, uh, a T4, G4 type uh, instance to do uh, the fastest uh, inference out there. Uh, speaking of outposts, uh, one of the other bigger um, announcements that was made was uh, a single uh, server skew in a, in a one u form factor and that has graviton 2 in it so what that means is a, a much lower entry price for outposts and a much smaller form factor and what wasn't uh, trumpeted uh, necessarily on the keynote is that these are uh, uh, you get these with arm based uh, graviton 2 uh, uh, inside so think less about a a regional data center, think more of this being in a fast food restaurant uh, attached to the wall or a gas station uh, underneath uh, the desk. And it was one of the key objections that I know that customers had uh, about outposts, right? Uh, and, and I see this as them knocking uh, another one out. So you can get full racks, you can get a one U, you can get two U uh, in there. And with most not all of AWS's uh, services and uh, uh, compute uh, uh, capabilities. And the, uh, the other one, the other EC2 announcement that really caught my eye uh, was the um, one with AMD, with Radeon Pro and Epic processors, uh, the EC2 G4 AD. Now, first off, I had never heard of a Radeon Pro uh, V520. And I was, as I was getting pre-briefed, I was anxiously uh, uh, doing a Google search on it. Subsequently, um, I was told that it's a, a custom card uh, that is for AWS, uh, eight gigs, uh, high speed, high speed memory, um, some tricks they're doing with uh, with PCIe that's attached to the second gen AMD Epic processor. My guess is is they're they're going to go PCIe four for the highest performance. This is essentially for, think of this as workstation in the cloud, okay? Uh, they're not uh, necessarily rolling out the virtualization capability, but it, it's more of a one-to-one -one than let's say a, a one-to-many virtualized uh, environment. Think about Amazon Workspaces as an example. You wanna run your workstation app, you wanna do game streaming or uh, generalized graphics rendering. but. Daniel, to your very intelligent um, macro point here, this is about choice. And one thing I think Amazon's doing really well is I don't think they're pissing off the, they're, they're not throwing their own silicon in the face of their partners. They're taking a very scientific approach to this. If they want the highest performance, they'll put something in there that's, that's the highest performance. If it's NVIDIA, boom. Uh, if it's AMD, boom. If it's their own stuff, boom. Now, those probably come in 18-month increments or 12-month increments. but uh, And then they have their lowest cost uh, uh, way they choose silicon. Again, their own silicon, other people's silicon, uh, it doesn't matter. And the secret sauce underneath this, and, and you and I have both written about this, is the nitro layer, right? And listen... Offloading uh, doesn't necessarily have the sex appeal that a giant training chip dove does, but over the past six years, uh, AWS has built a layer 
that has disaggregated compute from storage, uh, security, and even virtualization. And what that enables you to do, it enables you to much more quickly move in different flavors and brands of compute because typically security, management, virtualization, and networking offload uh, is inextricably linked uh, to, to, to that processor. So I, I, some people say IaaS is commoditized. And, and as I learned from one of my uh, biggest uh, tutors or mentors when I was in my 20s is that he said, Patrick, uh, things don't just get commoditized. People allow things to get commoditized. And I, I believe that through my, uh, throughout my entire career. And what AWS is doing is, is they are decommoditizing IaaS, okay, through vertical uh, integration uh, and choice. Yeah. So obviously for everyone out there listening, six, five, we're doing a double segment on reInvent. There was 300 plus announcements. <laughs> so just so you understand, it'll kind of be the five plus five, five, five today, just because uh, we got to do this a little bit differently, um, which is why we're still on this. But second, it's worth being on because there's so much happening here. Pat, you made a great point about disaggregation. Um, it, it is a really big part of the overall strategy of AWS has more to do with choice Andy's said for years about meeting customers where they are. I think for a few years, one of the er uh, areas that Andy had been somewhat reticent and the whole AWS business had been somewhat reticent to meet the customer has been hybrid and multi-cloud. You're starting to see some um, kind of backing off there as well because there's more and more opening uh, up to the idea of true hybrid, which isn't even just outposts, but truly that workloads could exist on-prem Workloads could exist in other clouds, and AWS is building, um, you know, more and more support for for that. A um, couple other things, Pat, just quickly, because I'm, you know, you really covered the EC2 stuff well. Um, there's a couple of things that caught my attention that maybe worth worth mentioning. One is the the advancements with containers, the ECS and a EKS everywhere. Great example, right? Before it was containers in AWS. Uh, running AWS, the whole migration in this particular show really focused on containers being uh, managed, deployed, developed anywhere for both on-prem and for AWS using AWS's tool set, which I think is going to make uh, developers and AWS uh, infrastructure users very happy. Um, a couple other things, by the way, and on top of that, what was called AWS Proton, which is going to be basically your full stack management for automation and serverless. The one thing I've learned, Pat, um, talking to many enterprises working with containers has been, it's not about doing a container that's hard. It's about having 15,000 enterprise applications and microservices, and you're trying to do this at scale. So this automation layer with Proton is going to be really important. Another thing, um, just too little of observations, because I could talk about this forever, but one was what they're doing with database, Pat, very interesting. OK, the whole database, the Babelfish, um, you know, SQL serverless, the ability for people to basically migrate SQL licenses, SQL licenses to AWS um, Aurora with Babelfish um, is going to be a very interesting competition discussion going forward. Uh, Andy and the team at AWS is really looking to make this transition easy and as the economics um, of not having all the licensing costs could get very interesting and start to create a lot of competition there. Go ahead. Well, it's pretty cool to put your uh, Microsoft SQL apps right on top of of a MySQL from Amazon is is pretty cool. <laughs> right. It cool. Uh, and it's also got a big economic thing that's going to bring some debate and it's going to push some innovation from Azure. They're going to have to make some innovation, make some decisions on how they want to respond uh, to this particular uh, development. And one other thing too, just worth mentioning, because I talked about Proton and containers and I talked about Babelfish is um, there's a bit of a juggernaut within AWS for software. Um, what they're doing with Connect uh, for, you know, for everything from voice and video to contact center, it's really deep. And by the way, if you didn't know, companies like Slack and Salesforce are actually using some of this stuff um, in the back end of, of their offerings. But, you know, it's almost like it's a sleeping giant here. Also, a bunch of business intelligence apps, Pat, where they're doing um, ML and enrichment of data and offering real-time dashboards of intelligence for everything from supply chain and operations to financials. I mean, quietly, AWS is starting to really uh, enter that stack 
of cool. the SaaS side where it's not going to be so quiet for much longer. Yeah, that's right. And and we'll be able to hit on these in future shows. I think next show we, we should do a drill down. But here's the way I look at it. Uh, AWS looks at its opportunities and uh, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, and uh, it gets itself ready. If it doesn't have an IaaS customer for a certain application, they're going to build the application themselves, right? Um, like Contact Center, I think, is a great opportunity. I don't think that the majority of the cloud contact centers are using AWS, and therefore, AWS is going to build uh, their own and kind of ready to, to go in and pounce. Uh, uh, Zoom does most of its IaaS on AWS, but in the wings, you've got Chime, <laughs> right? That 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 let's say you know uh, Zoom got ornery. Um, a, a, AWS could come in and and make that a full blown market it more than they do uh, today.